Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Farhan Tahir, joining you from Philadelphia. Today, my class fellow, Dr. Rubab Karog. That's right. <laughs> is joining me today. Thank you, Rubab. How are you? I'm fine, Farhan. How are you? Good. I was afraid I was going to butcher your last name. So if I did, please let me know. Correct me if that's the correct name. But it's a beautiful name. Thank you. Thank you. You don't know how my... Uh, first name gets butchered here in Denmark, so I'm pretty used to it. <laughs> pretty used to it. Okay, good. I, uh, I've been looking forward to talking to you uh, about 20 years. Uh, they have flown by, <laughs> our lives have taken us so in different directions, and I'm so happy that we got a chance to talk to each other and, and meet you um, virtually. So how is life uh, with you during COVID? Mm -hmm. Uh, life is life is good. Uh, actually, COVID uh, wasn't that bad here in Denmark. Uh, my work schedule was pretty much the same since you can see I work in obstetrics. So there you cannot go on to virtual uh, births or anything. So that was pretty much the same. Um, I actually got a little bit time to see my uh, kids because my kids have so many extracurricular activities. So because of COVID, they were kind of stuck at home. So that was really nice because then I got to spend some time with them. I know it's been a global phenomenon. The kids are at home. Uh, and um, especially if you are getting, um, you know, driving around for the sports, I've been enjoying that because I don't yeah. know where my evenings used to go. Um, okay, well, that's good. There's some good things out of COVID. Exactly. Uh, so. Let's talk about our professional part of our lives uh, as we've been doing in our interviews. Mm -hmm. um, when we graduated from Robert Pindi Medical College, I know that you were gonna move out of Pakistan because you were one of the few kids um, or students who were foreign nationals, I remember talking to you. So when did you leave Pakistan? Um, I left Pakistan after uh, almost doing my house job. Actually, that's very strange that you were so sure about it because I wasn't sure about leaving Pakistan. Uh, but, uh, but I did, um, after my house job, I left. Um, what, and where did you do your house job? Um, I did my first three months in Holy Family in Gaini, uh, uh, Usme Unit 3. That's where I got the paid house job. So then because of some family reasons, I moved to Lahore because as you know, I basically come from Lahore. And uh, I did the, there I started with my, uh, in medical unit in uh, um, Jinnah uh, Medical College affiliated to Lama Iqbal, and then moved on to do gynae uh, again after six months. But by that time, it was like already been planned that I had to go to Denmark. So yeah, I wasn't that, that serious about it anymore. Yeah. Okay. So, um, how did you end up coming, uh, becoming a physician? Is it your decision, your parents' decision? Um, what do you remember? It, oh, yeah, it's, um, I think it's, it's a society decision. Isn't that true? It's not parents, it's not yours. It's a society decision. I uh, was one of the few kids who never wanted to be a doctor. I actually didn't want to be a doctor for like 15 years ago still. Um, I always want, uh, the only other thing I knew when it could be was an engineer. So I always wanted to be an engineer. I loved maths. Um, and, uh, but you know, um, there are always pros and cons And that time for 20 years ago or 25 years ago when we had to choose our career. Uh, I think for me, it was very, very important to be more independent. And since I had no plans of moving abroad, I thought the only field where I could be independent in Pakistan would be studying medicine. So that was the reason. And of course, my grandparents always wanted me to be a doctor. Everybody, I mean, nobody could see, I'm you are the topper, you have to be like all of you, exactly. Everybody gets pressured from the society that if you are getting good grades, you are going to be a doctor. But my, that was my basic reason for becoming a doctor, to be more independent, to be more self-sufficient. 
Very nice. I think it's it's a very smart decision, and I'm glad that you were thinking that way because you know most um, when I look back growing up, I did not know what I was doing, and, but I just wanted to be a physician because that profession was what I liked. But uh, for women, it's really important, especially in our society, to be dependent financially and be able to sustain themselves. So um, I think right there, there is a good message. Um, so um, what do you remember from RMC? Were you, you were a hostelite, right? And you used yeah. to commute back and forth? Um, I mean, uh, you used to go back to Lahore on vacations. R remind me again. Uh, my memory yeah. Is uh, my family for a very short period of time were in Jhelum. Uh, so I actually ended up doing my, my uh, college from Jhelum. Uh, so for the first few couple of years, I used to go to Jhelum. But then my mom moved back to Denmark. Or my family moved back to Denmark. And uh, and then I started commuting to to Lahore, where where the rest of my family was. Okay. So yeah. Um, do you do you remember some of your friends who were your best friends back in RMC? Could you give me? Yeah, a couple? yeah. I had a lot of good, very good friends. Well, I I have to say, Sadia, she was in Hostelite. Uh, she 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 is, she was my best friend, and uh, then Munazza. Uh, as you know, um, then I also had a couple of very good friends in in uh, in college that were not hostelites, like uh, another of Sadia's and Servat. Um, Faika was a very good friend too. But but I think I, if I have to say best friend, that would four, be Sadia. Five, four or five girls around you. I remember that. I don't remember. <laughs> I remember Munaza for sure, but I don't remember others as your uh, but uh um yeah you had uh, would you say your rmc life was a good life or how would you oh definitely yeah i yeah. i loved rmc life and um, uh, i think i focused a little too less on studies and a little bit too much on everything else but that was the fun you know you've been studying yeah. so hard all your life and yeah uh, so so i really really enjoyed rmc well um how did you decide to, um, well, let me ask you, currently you are an uh, OBGYN physician, right? Obstetrics, yeah, yeah. gynecologist. Um, and you kind of um, told me that two, two of the residency or uh, house job opportunities were also GYN. So you always wanted to be a GYN doctor or just? Yeah, that, that was def pretty, I was pretty clear about that. When I, we did our rotation uh, during medical college in ob uh, I knew that if I ever wanted to practice medicine, I, I, it would be ob um, Because you see, I still wasn't sure at that stage I was ever going to practice medicine. I was just doing it to, to, to just do it's it. It's a but very <laughs> tough field though. I think about it, you have to be a surgeon, you have to be a good medical physician. Mm. And you also have to be a little bit of a pediatrician. Because you're taking care of the baby too, <laughs> when the baby is a fetus. Uh, yeah. But uh, tell us a little bit about your life in Denmark when you came. Did you have to go through residency? What is the training like there? Uh, well, the very the most important thing uh, in t coming to Denmark is that you had to learn language. That is something. Uh, um, uh, that, that's why you don't have a lot of people from India or Pakistan doctors coming to Denmark. Um, my uh, mom was the, actually when I came here, they needed doctors, so I probably could have gotten a job. By, but my mom was very adamant that I had to learn uh, Danish first. She said that once you learn bad Danish, it's very difficult to unlearn it. So I had to sit on a school bench and learn Danish for for like. I think I went to school six or seven months. Um, that was very hard time because all my friends, colleagues were going through part one and making their career and all I was doing was learning language. Um, but I, today I think it was a very good decision. It made things really easy for me. Um, and then I had to go through the exam just like in England or America, you had to do the language exam. No, I actually didn't have to do the language exam because I was a resident. That part I remember. Because it's a, otherwise, it's a must for foreigners. But since I was a resident, I didn't 
or a national, I didn't have to do the language exam. But I had to go through the, the, the ordinary exams and afterwards I uh, did my residency. It's a very, very, very different procedure compared to, to America and England. Um, there are no exams involved. So after you have done your basic medical exam and like kind of got the, that now you can work in Denmark, uh, then in order to just have your residency, you just need to qualify for it by, it's, it's a very gray zone. You don't like have that, okay, I passed this exam and then I can get into a, a, a rotation, a residency rotation. You kind of have, they have these seven roles that you have to fulfill. You have to have fulfill a role of as being an academic, a role of a professional, research role, um, so, so they are like, I don't even remember what those seven are at now, but, but you have to kind of fill in your CV with that and you just send it in and hope uh, to come to, to, to an interview and get selected. And ob is, is a tough field, uh, getting into residency also in Denmark. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I actually didn't use that much time. I pretty quickly got into my, my residency program after a few years here. Uh, and then uh, it's, a, it's a four four years, one, one, two, one, yeah, four years program. So, and where did you do that? What city was that? Um, it's called, uh, it's called, uh, the, you, you are always into a peripheral hospital and into a university hospital. So you have to rotate between these two. And the university hospital I was affiliated to is called Unse. Um, Unse. It's, it's, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it's, if you say in English, it would be Odense, O-D-E-N-S-E. Um, yeah. And, and the peripheral hospital was called Horsens. So that's where I did my residency. So tell us a little bit about the uh, life of a young physician in Denmark. Um, we know how Pakistan's life was. You know, we were running around with uh, labs when we had to transfuse somebody, would we'll go and pick up the transfusion bags and give it to them. It's like a lot of sweat work. Whereas in residency here, it's different. How is life in Denmark? Oh, uh, Denmark is also very, very different. It's actually even, I think it's mm, is much easier than, uh, than America and England even because, um, the working hours aren't that tough. They are they are very considerate about, about that people have a family. So you have it's it's very strong unions here. So you still have an an official working week of 37 hours. That's not possible for doctors, but they then this have these 12 hour 12 weeks or 10 weeks rotations where, and the average you shouldn't be working more than 37 hours. Um, so so that way it's really good. Um, and and it's one of the really good uh, health systems in in uh, in the in Europe. So so no, we don't have to do anything. There are people for there. I mean, I I have even forgotten how to take blood tests because you have uh, people coming doing for that, and you have nurses, highly qualified nurses, highly qualified midwives. So you just do the physician part. Very nice. Um, how. Uh, after you finished your uh, residency and you became an attending, mm -hmm. uh, did you stay in that hospital or did you move out and um, relocate somewhere to start your career? Actually, um, I have always, uh, we decided very early, long before even I got my residency to, to, build a, build a, to build a house. So I always knew that I need to, I would have to commute. So I've just, uh, I just traveled all over the place. I drove a couple of three hours a day or something like that. So I commuted. Uh, but I did move out of the hospitals. I did my residency in and went back to the hospital where I started my career, actually. I always wanted to go back there. Um, and um, actually, I've been working there for the past 10 years as consultant. Wow. So you, at some point, you had to, to commute for three hours a day? Yeah, while I was in this university hospital in Lindsay, I, it was a one and a half hour drive on the highway every day. That was tough with two small kids. Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. okay. Um, 
Okay, and now um, with 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 this behind you now, being in being in attending for about ten years now, you would say you've been working. How do you? How, what do you say about your life? as a physician now, is that something that you are enjoying? You like it? Uh, are you satisfied? Um, yeah, well, that that's also a process, you know, you're satisfied a few years or, or, or months and then you're not satisfied anymore. So of course it was a big achievement once you get to, are done with your residency, then the next step was getting to be a consultant because you have this, this period when you a specialist but you're still not a consultant so you have a few years there and then it's an achievement and then I started working into got my subspeciality into the uh, medical disorders in pregnancy and uh, that that was that was where I actually started getting you know my satisfaction because before that I was still a bit confused if, if this is really what I want to do for the rest of my life but after I started working with that I never knew I, I liked medicine so much, but I actually did, or I actually do. Um, I think that's where I uh, feel felt most satisfied. Um, few so years you're there. kind of an obstet obstetrician who knows a lot about medicine, I guess. So tell us what interests you um, medically uh, that you bring into obstetrician, um, you know, care, like taking care of high-risk pregnancies, that kind of stuff? Um, of course, everybody, uh, high-risk pregnancy is one thing, but I work a lot with, with um, women with different, like most, most of my patients are diabetics. So I work a lot with diabetics, uh, pre-diabetics, gestational diabetics. Um, I actually also work with people with uh, psychiatric disorders. So it's really far, no, that's a, maybe not the right word, but to like kind of figuring out through all their medicine they are taking, how it's working out, how do they affect the fetus, how do they affect the, the you also have to take care, think as you know that uh, there's a period after birth also. So how would it affect there, the child, the breastfeeding, um, working through this, this puzzle and, uh, and of course also the medical disorders, that's really, really interesting. Uh, I work with a lot of people not, that are not obstetric, uh, not obstetricians. I work a lot with, with, with endocrinologists, with dermatologists, with, uh, with infection medicine people, with, with psychiatrists. Um, so, so it gives you a big network and I really enjoy that. I think I like the small part of medicine that's just related to the med So as soon as it gets a little bit complicated, you can just refer them to the rheumatologist. Yeah, sure. But, but yeah. uh, it's interesting. I Now I recall I was a resident, second or third, maybe intern, and my chief resident was rounding with us. And um, one day she just almost collapsed during rounds. And then uh, she excused herself later on uh, she said, I'm sorry, I, and then she told us she was pregnant, but she, but I was like, okay. Later on, she disclosed to us that she actually was diagnosed with gestational diabetes, and sometimes she became, becomes so hypoglycemic that it, it happens to her. So I, before that, I've never, like, kind of had a patient encounter, a person encounter with diabetes and pregnancy at that time. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, um, I... Uh, my wife didn't have these problems, but uh, I now I can relate to how it is, and it's even for physicians, it was kind of nervous for her. Mm. Okay, so tell me a little bit about your. Um, you you said Denmark health system is good, and I believe that it's one of the best systems, and European health systems are good. Are there any roadblocks that you see um, working there that you would like it to be changed or improved? Well, everything can always be improved. Um, um, it's a it's it, it's very different from what I've grown up with. If um, that that is the sometimes I miss that there's a little too less theory here. Um, uh, I I actually like it the way it is. The whole me, whole educational system here. I was actually just seeing that all the groups, RMC group, was going through 
this lot of educational debate how it is. But the, Dan the Danish educational system is, is not based on, definitely not based on Rota system. It's more like, well, you have all the information just a click away. You don't have to know it by heart. You, would, you should just know how to find it. And that's, that's very, very good. They, they teach people how to find, get your information. But at times, I feel that it wouldn't be that bad if, if there was a little more theory involved um, in that. Um, what I would say about how the medical system could be actually once you have experienced the the the, the system in pakistan uh, it's very difficult to see how this could get any better um, it is one of the one of the top uh, health systems uh, here there's not that much workload but um, things can always get better they are very small things i can't really point out one big issue uh, here uh, that could get uh, better so let me ask you, with the um, uh, advent of uh, technology um, and COVID-19, most of um, American doctors, hospitals, clinics converted within three days to uh, video chat, telemedicine. Um, how did you guys do that? It was never affected at all and you guys always had in-person exams or was it ever converted to telemedicine? Uh, no, of course it was. I, I, I think that the medical uh, doctors went, uh, the, the physicians, the um, internal medicine people, they went into into the, the telemedicine part a little more. Um, in our field, what actually happened was that we immediately closed down for all the outpatient and the people who had to come in uh, or, or had to be seen, they, they just came in. Um, a few of the obstetric uh, cons uh, consultations were also on video or audio, um, but the guy needed just shut it down totally. And uh, so, so it was a mix. They, they closed, they, they stopped a lot of uh, operations. They stopped a kind of lot of um, uh, things that could wait, the, the elective surgeries, the elective consultations. Uh, but those that have to come in, they came in. Um, there were very strict measures about it, uh, and Danish people are really, really good at following orders. They are they they, they are groomed to follow orders, Not so, so that was no problem. Pakistani. I just interviewed or talked to one of the physicians in Birmingham, UK, and he said Pakistani community was just like in Pakistan; they would not listen to much of the instructions. So that's probably our national problem. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh, the life now you have taken as a physician, um, now a mother, wife. What things have made you stronger? What has been um, that you are look back and you're like, you know, these, these years ha have changed me as a person. Is there anything you want to talk about? Well, a lot of things have changed me. I um, I actually think I was, um, not that I don't speak my mind out today, but I think I was much more outspoken back in that time. So I think I've, with age, I've gotten a bit wiser. Um, it, this, this society has changed me a lot. It's, it's very, very different from, from the, the, the culture. The, the, they are very quiet, humble people. Uh, they have this this very strange law that's called Yentelaun. You shouldn't. It's it's it means that you shouldn't think you are something. So so every time you try to kind of put yourself up. Oh my God! I built such a big house. Let's take an example. They just say, Oh my God! Who's going to clean this house? So so they, 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 this is a society that really doesn't get impressed by much. Uh, they also have a lot of uh, equality. They're they're. Of course, there are people that are really rich and there are people that are poor, but most of the people, there's a very huge middle class here. Uh, they have this very complex uh, uh, progressive tax system, so you never really get to get that rich. Um, and that has, that has taught you because it, it makes you more humble. It uh, uh, makes you, they, they are very satisfied people. They are I, they say they sell. They say that they are very happy people. I think they are most like satisfied people. Uh, 
they, they try to appreciate the things they have. Uh, of course, there's a downside to it. They're not that ambitious. Uh, and so it can, kind of takes the ambition out of you, I feel. I, I'm a, I would say I still am, but I was a very, very ambitious person. But I think they have kind of calmed me down a bit. Let, let's enjoy what you have. Let, let's try to appreciate what you have instead of always looking forward, trying to achieve more. So that is what has changed me. Well, it was a great answer because let me tell you, if you ever have to live in America, it's the opposite of exactly what you said. Americans are never satisfied with what you have. They would rather have 28 hours a day rather than 24. And, and I think sometimes it leads to burnout. Mm. There's a huge amount of burnout in the society, in American society, especially physicians for the same reason. Um, my next question was how you balance your life between a physician and your personal life. And you already answered that question that the society actually tells you to balance it all. Yeah. Uh, I would just comment as a physician, of course, you're working a lot. Uh, none of us have a, have a 37 hours week. Of course we don't. Uh, I had in periods work like more, more than 100 hours a week. But yes, there's still a, a very much um, consideration of your family life. Uh, you can easily, if you want leave, if your kid is sick, if you're, it's a short example, we have like a whole year maternity leave here. Where, uh, where half of it is fully paid and half of it is also partially paid. So you have a year paid uh, maternity leave because they, they, they the appreciate value the value. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. And of fatherhood, because here they are very much into that. The fathers should also take maternity leave. The mothers won't let go of it, but you actually can share the whole year. That's very good. That's very interesting. I like it. Yeah. Uh, I am I'm liking the fact gratitude is one thing that I uh, is one of the values that are, are very dear to me because I think no day should be started without gratitude, which you just said that you this this society has taught you for that. You talked a little bit about emotional intelligence or hinted towards you know just control your emotions, think about it, mm -hmm. reflect. And that's really good, good things. I'm, uh, I'm enjoying that uh, cultural talk that you've given. So um, is there any life advice that you would like to share and conclude this professional session with us uh, that, a, that may help anyone who's listening to you? Um, you have learned it here from this society. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely because of the society and part of it is, for one thing, don't rush. You have lots of time. I mean, we rushed. It was so important for us, getting physician, going to house job, doing our residency. And so what? Now we are physicians for the rest of the life. Uh, so I, one thing I say, don't rush, give yourself time. I know that is not how our society is. But I really encourage my kids, my daughter, now that she's going in, coming, uh, getting a little older, don't rush into it. You have your whole life to be adults, to be professionals. Um, take a deep breath. I think if had I studied medicine, if I had been a little older, I would have studied it in very different perspective than I did when, like, when we were 18 and 19. Uh, so that is one thing I think that don't, don't, don't rush into. Uh, and then once you decide the thing that you want to pursue, then pursue it. Don't let anything it try. It. If you don't get it once, try it again. And if you don't succeed second time, try again. Because don't think what is easy the next three months or six months or five years. Okay, getting into this residency is easy. Uh, think what would how you, it would be 10 years from now so maybe the first five six years would be tough but the next 20 30 40 years would be good very good advice i think uh, uh, i if i could go back and fix the things that i didn't mess up 
uh, in my life, even when I came here, uh, I would have been, a, you know, it, it, it's a very good advice. Rushing, it, it's, it, we don't have to rush in. And things take time sometimes. There is time yeah. and place for everything. So let it be. Thank you so much. With this, we'll conclude our professional session. But don't go away. We have to talk about some fun stuff too. Okay. Sure.